Out of every episode we see in the eight season long run of Word Girl, this episode special is my favorite, both part one and part two. Word Girl is somehow formulaic in that we see Word Girl trying to get by as Becky Botsford without drawing attention to her superhero life. The episodes usually start off with Becky in class or at home with friends and family. She's interrupted, so she has to make an excuse to leave for a bit to save the day and put the bad guys away. Usually it takes a few tries to stop the villains because of poor timing managing both lives, or maybe she needs to figure something out first and try something new. After learning a lesson or teaching a lesson, she returns to her life as Becky, and the city is a better place afterward. A world without Word Girl takes everything we've come to know and take for granted and flips it entirely on its head, dropping us and Becky into a whimsical new reality where the people are familiar but everything is so, so wrong. The Word Girl crew does an amazing job at taking Fair City and making it truly feel like a zany alternate reality through subtle details and excellent world building. And it would have been easy for this episode to have been written lazily, just changing a few things for the sake of teaching Word Girl to value her role as Word Girl, such as having her dream about it, which completely loses all stakes, or simply taking away her option to be Word Girl without changing anything else. The Word Girl team put a lot of effort, humor, and creativity into making this AU feel so special as if it was a movie with all new sets, a larger cast, and very cool costumes. In today's video, we're going to go through the episode and talk about all these elements that make this episode one of the best, and in my opinion, the best in the show. AUs, or alternate universes, are usually reserved for fandoms to partake in to transform the original media in a fun and meaningful way, through discussion, fan art, or fanfics. AUs take the cast and basic traits of personalities, relationships, and statuses of the characters and gives that all new context. Some of the most popular AUs are zombie apocalypse, high school slash college, coffee shop, werewolves and vampires, fairies, etc. These are the more general options because all they do is change the setting, character dynamics, and conflict, so it can apply to almost any fandom. More specific AUs are usually specific to a fandom, like in this episode of the show asking, what if there was suddenly no word girl? AUs don't have to have deep meaningful themes because sometimes you just want to put these characters into situations for funsies, but it's cool when they do. When an AU wants to say something through this alternate universe with different stakes and dynamics, it's so interesting to see how the author or artist uses the elements of this new environment to make a refreshing take on the characters and story. Some of the best AUs put the characters into situations that complement the already existing personalities and relationships. Personally, my favorite AUs are the ones where almost everything is changed except for the characters themselves, because I really enjoy seeing the artist or writer take creative liberties to create a very rich world for their favorite characters. For example, two characters having an undying love for each other in canon is so dreamy and exciting in a fantasy AU, with sword fights and magic and extravagant fashion, not to mention the intrinsic artistry in decadent fantasy settings. Or another example, taking a found family group of characters and placing them into a dystopian or apocalyptic world where the bonds you make with others is key to survival. AU serve to be self-indulgent, and or highlight the best parts of characters and their dynamics. In this case, I think it was a mix of both. This video will feature screenshots for context of what I'm saying, and I'd love to show you clips, but the video would probably get claimed if I do that. So I'll be reenacting the scenes to help as always. This episode of Word Girl very adventurously asks, what if there was no Word Girl? A World Without Word Girl is a very clever and exciting character study of Becky's self-indulgent daydream of having normal 12-year-old responsibilities versus the more realistic worst-case scenario where the entire city would fall to the rule of crime and part of vocabulary. The thematic purpose of this episode is Becky learning to love being Word Girl again and finding new appreciation for her role as the protector of Fair City while also being an outlaw and on the run from King Chuck and his villain army. This AU of Word Girl doesn't exist and so the city fell to Chuck's overbearing sandwich themed decree is very whimsical and an intense change of pace from what Becky and the viewers are used to, which makes it so exciting to see such iconic and constant roles being completely flipped to create a backwards and weird world for Becky and Bob to get turned around in and chased after in. When watching the special, you can tell the writers dedicated themselves to making an episode that has a very interesting premise of self-reflection and a very fun and creative theme of what a world run by villains would look like. The episode begins with a very pretty invitation to Becky's birthday party, heightening the experience from the start. We see Becky's mom making the cake, Becky's dad hanging up a pinata, and TJ placing some pretty princess plushies on the coffee table. The entire main area of the house is decorated with balloons, streamers, cupcakes, and so many other cute details in the theme of Becky's favorite show. 
pretty princess. The dedication to this theme is very consistent and impressive, with how Becky's parents make sure that each activity of the party ties into pretty princess. Her dad explains that he and Mrs. Botsford have been planning this amazing extravagant party for three months. They're both so excited and they almost can't get through the introduction to the festivities, and Becky's excitement turns to ecstatic thrill thinking about all the possibilities that could be in store for her very special party. Mr. Botsford sneaks away into the backyard as Mrs. Botsford tells Becky they can begin as soon as she puts the cake in the oven so that it'll be ready by the end of the night, letting her and the audience know that that'll be the conclusion to the party. After just a moment, we can see that there is now a giant bouncy castle in the backyard that Mr. Botsford set up. He leads the family out for the reveal of this activity, and Becky's overcome with awe and excitement for what will probably be a good hour of jumping in the bouncy castle. Something that I adore about the portrayal of the Botsford parents is how high energy and silly they are. Like, they seem to be more excited about Becky's party than the kids are. Kids will often mimic those around them, especially their parents or caregivers, and showing Mr. and Mrs. Botsford hyping up the celebration far above what they have to is a subtle detail that's mostly played for goofs, but the impact of that kind of dedication shows that they care so so deeply about how Becky, TJ, and Bob feel. They're showing the audience these two parents care so much for their kids and they show it. To me, Word Girl has always been a show about how things should be when it comes to relatable moments like this, and it's amazing to see it modeled in a fun, lighthearted way. Before Becky can go into the bouncy castle, she hears a voice calling for help in the city. Bob being able to hear it too, apparently? <laughs> With no hesitation, she reminds herself, Bob, and the audience of her promise to keep the city safe after quickly defining obligation. She zooms off to respond to the call for help, with the assumption that afterwards that she can quickly return to play with everyone else. The conclusion to this scene shows Scoops, Violet, and Violet's cat arriving at Becky's house together with their presence. This is a very subtle detail that will be built upon throughout part one. We see the setting of the active crime scene, a sandwich shop. The shop is very cute in its sandwich-themed decor like the building being shaped like a giant sandwich. We very quickly find out that the perpetrator is Chuck the Evil Sandwich Making Guy, threatening to spray spicy mayo on the customers if they get too close. While making his threats, the camera is panning out to the rest of the restaurant, seemingly unfazed by his presence. A woman is quietly finishing her sandwich, and a man is ordering a 10,000 inch long sub while the employee considers violence or diplomacy, choosing the latter. The employee begins talking to Chuck, asking him why the heck he's doing this. A pattern I've noticed in the mindsets between neutral or good civilians versus the villains is that the civilians can't be bothered to give much thought to the villains in their presence. There are so many times where instead of being terrified by the big bad villain, they just act inconvenienced or go about the situation as they would any. The grocery store manager, the bank teller, Reginald, none of them care at all. And I think it's because it's a combination of knowing that they're not really in any danger and the trust that they have in Word Girl that she'll be there no matter what what, because she made a promise to, and she always keeps her word. Chuck replies to the employee, presumably the owner of the shop, that he's supposed to be the sandwich king, and he only wants people to eat sandwiches made by him. The employee explains that people go to his shop to eat sandwiches made by him, asking him, Do you understand that, Mr. Sandwich Head? Chuck's demeanor quickly changes to being very self-conscious and asking the man not to call him that. The employee points out that his hand is the shape of a sandwich, though. This interaction establishes that Chuck has aspirations to be the most evil sandwich maker in the city and gets very bothered by people poking holes in his plans. He thinks very highly of himself and his abilities, but is held back by small shortcomings like being called Sandwich Ed and the very obvious presence of Word Girl. Chuck says he goes by a nickname, and before he can say what it is, Word Girl arrives and the employee announces her entrance with, Word girl, which Chuck misunderstands as the employee filling the blank himself. This scene is so funny to me because the entire time Word Girl and Huggy are striking their classic marketing poses until Chuck notices she's there. Chuck exclaims that no one tells him what to do and goes on to talk about his family a little and Word Girl grows impatient, seeing as she's missing out on her own birthday party. Word Girl tells him that she doesn't have time for this and Chuck responds with, boy, you seem antsy. And it's a joke that comes up a couple more times after this, but it also serves to highlight that at that moment where Word Girl is trying to get back to her normal life where something special and amazing is happening, she's not really being taken seriously because no one knows about the struggle of time between her two lives. When she finally gets home to play in the back Bouncy castle. She discovers that she and Bob are the only ones playing. Her parents are surprised and amused that she's still in the bouncy castle and let her know that the next surprise is ready. 
Becky is disappointed that she missed the first activity, but tries to move on because the next surprise is pony rides. She's thrilled about seeing the real life ponies and getting the chance to ride one like her favorite character of all time, Pretty Princess, from her favorite show. We see Violet and Scoops together on the ponies, Violet riding one of the ponies and Scoops following behind with a camera to document such a fun day. The moment she's left to finally be able to engage with an exciting activity at her own party, she hears the same voice call for help. What's an interesting choice about this episode is that usually the exposition guy will come in yelling his hysterically about needing help, very much in distress, so it's easy for Becky to make the choice to leave what she's doing and go help. Just wait until Word Girl hears about this. She'll stop your plan. How will she find out? I'll take this one. Help! In this episode, the person calling for help doesn't seem to have the same urgency in his voice, so it's a great way to show how Becky is beginning to view the situation as more annoying and bothersome rather than urgent and heroic. Becky downplays the situation and tries to convince herself that it'd be okay if she took one little pony ride before going to help at the sandwich shop. Bob is immediately not on board and neither is the narrator. Traditionally, they've both served as external moral compasses for Becky as she struggles to navigate both demanding lives. In this case, Becky is set on enjoying herself for a bit before taking care of her word girl duties, and understandably so. The narrator reminds her that word girl has a responsibility to the city to go out of her way and help no matter what. In this case, they're both right. Word girl does have this responsibility, but Becky also has the responsibility to be a kid and enjoy her friends and family. This isn't a critique on the show's premise of having a kid superhero, by the way. As a kid, I related a lot to Becky's struggle with having to choose between things she wants to do versus things she has an obligation to. Most of the time, I just wanted to play with my Barbies and draw, but I also had the responsibility to go to school and do my chores. When analyzing the show, it's important to remember who it's meant for, and I think the writers did a great job at illustrating the struggle between what kids want to do versus what they have to do throughout the show. In this two-part episode, we are supposed to feel sympathy for Becky, though, because instead of having to choose between two normal things, she's being given the choice between something incredible and amazing like bouncy castles and pony rides, or abandoning that to go save the day. The stakes are very much heightened, and the themes of this entire show are very much exaggerated throughout this two-part episode. Having a superhero main character like this doesn't mean that her powers will solve everything and be the root of the whole plot. It means we get to see relatable problems in a very different and much more exciting light. Becky hesitantly agrees with the narrator and Bob, and they whoosh off to save the sandwich shop again, her word up catchphrase coming out a lot more irritated. We see the same sandwich shop, and the man who ordered that surfboard sized sub is now halfway through eating it, and the employee from earlier is cleaning the spot where the lady was eating before. The butcher is now here yelling, okay everyone stand back while I untie my friend Chuck, as everyone else is just minding their own business. It's cute to see them sticking together and coming to each other's aid. He lifts the tangled deli ticket dispenser from Chuck and tosses it to the side. Word Girl then swiftly arrives on the scene, ties them both up after a quick definition and some other exchanged words before rushing back home. Becky and Bob arrive back at the house to find that the ponies, also dressed up as Pretty Princess and Count Cloudy, are now sleeping and all the other party guests are gone. She once again panics, wondering why the ponies aren't giving rides anymore and where everyone went. Her parents explain that the ponies are exhausted from giving so many rides, but they have one more surprise, more spectacular than the others. They walk into the backyard and see a Pretty Princess themed Ferris wheel, lights and music and such pretty and vibrant colors. We once again see Violet and Scoops together on the ride with the other guests. Becky is absolutely blown away with this last surprise and is set on going for a ride. What I like about this last surprise is that every activity has been stepping up in the magical element. We started off with the bouncy castle, pretty standard for a lot of suburban kids in America. Then we moved on to pony rides, which is pretty uncommon to have access to in your kid's own yard. And usually organizations have these set up at town events or a farm itself. This last surprise being a Ferris wheel is realistically impossible in real life. And it really makes you feel so, so sad for Becky that this is the most incredibly fun party activity to have in your own backyard. And she's called away once more. The audience knows that based on the last two activities, Becky will very likely miss this one too. The audience can still hold hope, knowing that the show won't leave us depressed seeing our favorite superhero miss her entire birthday party just because she puts the needs of the city above her own. She and Bob leave and arrive for the last time for the afternoon as Word Girl and Captain Huggy face at the sandwich shop, where there is now a mouse-shaped blimp parked outside. All three food-based villains working together is so cute and funny because this doesn't look like the first time that they've all tried bailing each other out before the police arrive. They very quickly test her patience, fail, and she drags them to jail herself before flying off, desperately trying to get to her party. For the entire episode so far, it's been daytime, but after dropping off the three food villains, minus two brains as henchmen, it's 
it's getting very close to sunset. This lighting transition visually tells us that taking the villains to jail took a while, but decided to anyway because the police were taking too long to arrive. Also, seeing these three villains working together in part one, especially with Two Brains' line of, us food villains have to stick together, you know, is such an interesting setup for the rest of the special. And suddenly, before she heads home, the energy monster springs up from the city, and the narrator suggests that maybe the energy monster is just hanging out? Before Word Girl and Captain Huggy Face get zapped, she quickly flies down to some giant industrial-sized electrical plugs, and she and Huggy get the power plant to absorb the energy monster's electricity, defeating her in the process. We see the electricity surging through the lattice tower, down the power lines, and all the way into the Botsford residence. The lights in all the windows flicker a neon yellow, and a very familiar face replaces the pretty princess's place on the TV. The cake baking in the oven is electrified with the same chaotic neon bolts, and what's left is an ominously glowing cake. When Becky and Bob fly home, they find that the power has been knocked out and the Ferris wheel is no longer working. Her dad tries to comfort her, telling her that whoever knocked the power out obviously didn't know that today was Becky's special day. What I like about how they write her parents in this scene is that from their perspective, Becky has had the absolute time of her life with all her friends, and when they see her so disappointed that the ride stopped working, they validate her feelings and try to cheer her up. This is important to me because I know so many parents would have probably told their kid in a similar situation to just suck it up and be thankful for what they got. We see that because of the support from her parents, Becky tries to salvage the night with a glowing yellow cake that her mom brings out. Becky notices the glow, but it's rationalized by mentioning that she used a new recipe, and they encourage her to make a wish for something that she wants the most in the world. She wishes that she could just be Becky Botsford, and that word girl never existed, and blows out the candles. Becky walks off to sulk near the deflated bouncy castle, while her brother TJ, who had been enjoying the party more than anyone, asks what she wished for. She replies that she can't tell him, referencing the old superstition that if you speak your wish aloud, it won't come true. TJ says he would have wished to meet his favorite hero, Chuck the Awesome Sandwich Making King. Becky continues fiddling with the deflated bouncy castle and asks if he actually meant Word Girl. TJ, who Becky knows is the president of the International Word Girl fan club, has no idea who that is. She tries jogging his memory thinking he's joking or something, but no one present at the party follows what she's saying. To them, in that moment, there is no Word Girl. A cool detail is that near the back porch on the deck, there were Word Girl and Huggy themed ornaments or lights draped over the wooden ledge that's visible before Becky makes her wish and disappear after she makes her wish. I also like the Word Girl decor outside because it has the same vibes as decorating for the family sports team. Becky turns to Bob to figure out why everyone is acting so strange before seeing the completely altered city before her. The buildings are all now shaped like sandwiches and there's now a giant King's Chuck statue and he's holding a condiment scepter and wearing a bread themed crown. She and Bob are flabbergasted to, and try to understand what happened in the few seconds she wasn't paying attention. A very fun and off-putting touch is that everyone in this scene has very unnatural smiles, like they're forcing themselves to. We see a small plushy toy of Chuck in TJ's hand before we see King Chuck himself a moment later on, now on the statue. I'm not just king of the sandwiches, I'm the king of the world. Right. Becky is anxiously pulling her hair and the narrator wraps up the episode with, Now that we've shown you part one, we have an obligation to show you part two, so don't miss the next exciting episode of Chucktopia. Becky and Bob gasp in terror before the narrator continues with, just kidding, word girl, which was so mean, but it hypes up the next episode. Part two of the episode opens with Becky, still horrified at her seemingly new reality, questions what in the world her parents put in that cake. Her mom lists off a few basic ingredients like flour, eggs, and butter, and her dad mentions how there was that big energy monster power surge and brings out the cake box. Becky takes it and reads it aloud. Warning, if electrified, cake may become enchanted. She laughs, thinking it's a joke, but quickly realizes that her wish really did come true. True. Bob sneaks the cake off her plate and before he can eat his own, she drags him off into the city to find out what's happening. She walks around the city seeing all the overwhelming changes and the buildings and infrastructure are all sandwich themed and the usual shops are now all sandwich shops. When the setting shifts to Chucktopia, it's like an immediate tone change where all the buildings are sandwich shaped, the architecture is sandwich ingredient themed, and even nature reflects this change so well. Another change that I thought was so cool was the use of Dutch camera angle, where the angle is tilted in a very unsettling way to convey a warped reality or uneasy feeling. It's not used properly often 
oftentimes, so it's amazing to see that it's used so well here. It appears at the moment we see Chucktopia from the inside for the first time. It really feels like a weird nightmare because to Becky, it is. They reach another section of the city overrun with King Chuck statues and sandwich theme art, and from the statue's mouth, an announcement plays instructing all citizens to only use sandwich words to communicate. A random couple on the sidewalk passes them saying the most incoherent sandwich sprinkled sentences I've ever heard. These abominations of speech upset Becky when she realizes that in her absence, people are being instructed to use words incorrectly. The couple warns her that disobeying King Chuck's orders would get her taken away. In a sandwich themed cop car, the butcher, now known as Sheriff Butcher, tells Becky that she's under arrest for distributing the peace. And she asks if he meant disturbing the peace. Her questioning of authority does not go over well. And after she attempts and fails at turning into word girl, she and Bob are arrested and put in the back of the car. They arrive at City Hall, which has now been turned into King Chuck's castle of sorts, where copies of Lady Redundant Women surround the building dressed in what looks like sandwich security detail uniforms. And inside we see a workshop with Hal Hardbargain and Toby McAllister III, who are building sandwich themed robots and machines undisturbed. In another room, the baker and Roel Demiglass are preparing sandwich bread, with what looks like the energy monster being used as fuel for the ovens. In the last room, there's a class being taught about King Chuck and sandwich terminology by the coach, and those attending the class are Steve McLean, Miss Question, Mr. Big, Big Left Hand Guy, Invisibil, and Timmy Timbo. Oh, and there's still a prison cell with Amazing Rope Guy. Also in the classroom where the coach is teaching the other villains about sandwich things, on the chalkboard there's a list of drawings with, of different sandwiches. One of those being a hot dog. It's canon that Chuck believes a hot dog is a sandwich. Feel free to leave a comment explaining why this is wrong because nothing is more fun and groovy in this life than that. Finally, Sheriff Butcher leads them to what used to be the mayor's office and is now King Chuck's lair and humble gaming room. Outside those doors are two brains' henchmen dressed like our Chuck and armed with condiment Rays. The doors open and we see King Chuck with his jeweled crown, royal scepter, and sandwich crest proudly on his torso. His room is a mix of classical paintings and cheap living furniture and tech. Chuck's design is so good. I love everything about it so much because it keeps his iconic color scheme and relative design, but the shape language and extra design elements of his clothing really make him stand out and give him a much more threatening presence. Adding him to the list of word girl plushies that PBS Kids needs to start mass producing for us. Becky tries to weasel her way out of any punishment by explaining that she and Bob are new in town, but is interrupted by King Chuck. He bluntly lays out the rules of Chucktopia, the land of many sandwiches, where he is king and everyone must do what he says or else. The first rule is that when it's time to use sandwich words, you may only use sandwich words. The second rule is that all stores must be sandwich stores. The third rule is that everyone must eat nothing but sandwiches, unless it's your birthday when you're allowed to eat cake. After questioning every single rule, she asks how he even became king of the city. King Chuck states that he started off like a normal criminal, but since there was no superhero to stop him, he was able to take over the city. The sandwich bell interrupts them and Brent, Chuck's brother, brings in a fancy sandwich cart. King Chuck and the butcher are so enchanted by the food that they don't notice Becky and Bob sneaking out. They run away into the streets and Becky quickly learns that her impressive stamina was a gift from the planet lexicon and she takes a moment to miss it very dearly. They find refuge in a random sandwich cafe and are surprised to see that her dad is also there. She asks him what he's doing there and he replies that he's eating a sandwich of course. The citywide mask of content is shattered when he makes a little comment about the bland, repetitive nature of forced daily sandwiches. Becky and Bob are hit with another surprise to see that Dr. Two Brains is there. I think initially the two might have been on edge to see him there, considering she's enemy number one in the eyes of all the villains. After addressing him as Dr. Two Brains, he tiredly reveals that he hasn't held the title of doctor in a long time, not since King Chuck booted him to working as a sub-junior assistant manager, which is so funny because I think only he and his boss Glenn work there. He speaks of a longing to wish upon an enchanted birthday cake so things would be different. Becky pipes up and exclaims, that's exactly what caused this. A few things I noticed. Normally in the food industry, you have to wear a cap or a hairnet to prevent hair falling in the food. And we see in a previous episode that Chuck hates hairnets for sensory reasons. He probably just told Two Brains to tie his hair back and he'd be okay. It's still gross though, so L food safety. Also, if you look in the menu in the sandwich cafe, there's a few types of sandwiches listed and one of them is a monstrous grilled cheese. It would be hilarious if it was originally a normal sandwich, but Two Brains kept making them with like 10 slices of every 
free cheese in stock and customers got mad that their sandwich didn't match the picture so they had to update it. In the sandwich cafe, everything in the building is King Chuck or sandwich themed, which I love so so much. I love the extent to which the artist filled Chucktopia with very silly and cool alternate reality objects and decor. There's a little golden plaque under Chuck's portrait where the trays go, which looks like an official seal of approval for the location, especially since Two Brains was specifically told to go work there by King Chuck. She takes a moment to explain that everyone but Becky and Bob are living through the philosophical concept of last Thursdayism because she wished on an enchanted birthday cake that she wasn't word girl. Two Brains suggests that if they still have the birthday cake, she can make another wish on it and get things back to normal. After assuming that they ate all the cake at the party, Bob reveals that he didn't eat his slice, so there's still hope. The gang leaves the cafe, minus Two Brains because capitalism calls and he needs to finish his shift before saving the world. Becky's dad drives the three of them back home, but not before Sheriff Butcher spots them and alerts the rest of the sandwich brigade, instructing King Chuck to bring the crusher to take care of him. Soon they're being tailed by King Chuck's villain army and his iconic sandwich crusher down the highway. The Whammer, Granny Mae, and Sheriff Butcher are all taking shots at stopping the Botsford station wagon. Until Sheriff Butcher decides to step things up and he sends a bratwurst bazooka and completely blocking their way off the freeway. Bob tries to eat through the giant pile of meat so their car can go through. King Chuck prematurely celebrates his victory, but suddenly the front shield of his crusher is doused with a runny cheese spray. Over a loudspeaker, we hear Dr. Two Brains commanding King Chuck to let her go so she can make her wish. Despite the ponytail and lack of a lab coat, it's our Two Brains. He's back in his mouse blimp that he apparently spends his free time working on. The butcher and Two Brains battle while Bob continues to clear the way and Two Brains manages to distract King Chuck's stylish friend group and the bots for speed back home, racing against the clock. They gather the cake, the candle, and Becky is able to rush out her wish that Word Girl existed and things were back to normal. In a magic poof, Becky opens her eyes and her family is no longer in front of her. She looks around for them and with a few questions confirms that things are indeed back to the way they used to be. With a new appreciation of her chaotic and often interrupted life as Becky and Word Girl, she almost joins her family in the conclusion of her birthday party before being called away to save the day. The characterization parallels between canon and the AU are interesting because they're consistent with how we've seen the characters react to things in the show, as well as their established character traits. But this episode twists so many of those traits that we've been led to believe were concrete and unwavering. This two-part episode is a very interesting character study of how circumstances influence and change motives and highlight personality traits in a very different and new context. Throughout part one, the world of Word Girl establishes and reminds returning viewers of the norms, even bringing out three classic villains to antagonize Word Girl. Chuck tried to shut down the sandwich shop, the butcher came to his rescue because they're friends, and Two Brains arrived to rescue them both because of his loyalty to food-themed villains. These are all very in character for them, and it also re-establishes Chuck's desire to be king of the sandwiches, which is fun to notice on a rewatch of the episode. Chuck's character begins the story as his usual, uncertain, and yet overly confident self with no serious standing in Fair City's list of terrifying villains. As the patrons of the sandwich shop he robs, as well as the owner of the shop, are not frightened at all by his presence. If anything, they're slightly annoyed at the inconvenience and interruption of their day. He's very easily beaten by Word Girl and Captain Huggy Face until the Butcher arrives to save him from ending up in prison. At the end of part one, we're shocked to see a giant looming statue of King Chuck, the King of Sandwiches. The first time watching this two-part episode, I couldn't believe this surprising twist. I thought maybe the story would take her down a less eventful path, but it surprises the viewers with this very frightening revelation that her wish came true in the most worst case scenario kind of way. In part two, King Chuck's character is contrastingly confident and powerful, bossing other characters around and his words actually having an effect on characters' choices, which previously never really happened. He now has a very bad influence on others, and it's interesting to see how the supporting cast respond to his commands and rules. Chuck already seemed to reflect on his strong dislike for others and their overbearing presence in his life, like his brother or the sandwich shop owner. This is shown in how he rules over the city, making his presence overbearing instead. When Becky is brought to King Chuck's throne room, which is just the mayor's office redecorated, we can see how King Chuck redecorated it and it's very interesting. There are a few paintings that are parodies of real life paintings that I'd like to show you. The first one is in the hall leading up to King Chuck's room. It appears to be a still life with a sandwich and soda. I don't think this painting in particular is based on a real famous painting, but the red velvety tablecloth, the green curtain, and the fancy little olive plant in the background give it renaissance vibes. The next painting
painting that's next to the side of King Chuck's couch is the Mona Lisa, but with a sandwich-shaped head. The next painting that's above his couch is Napoleon Crossing the Alps, where it originally pictures Napoleon Bonaparte riding his horse, though it's very idealized. This one is funny to me because King Chuck has this hanging right over his tiny little TV and game system. Chuck's other decor include his little red couch, tiny TV, game system, apartment-sized fridge, and store-bought looking sandwich ingredients on top of the fridge. Meanwhile, his crown is probably worth the combined income of every fair city citizen. I think the combination of suburban lifestyle and decadent royalty is hilarious for Chuck's character. Once he got all the power, he's like, I'm gonna commission these expensive paintings using taxpayer money, but after that, I'm making myself a sandwich with ingredients I got on sale at the grocery store. His character was so fun to see transform in this two-part episode, and I'm glad the writers chose him to be the big bad. Throughout the series, the butcher has been portrayed as thoughtful in his relationships with others. For example, he tries to get along with his stubborn father as best he can, he takes in a stray kitty because he looks scared and hungry all alone, and he even enrolled himself in class to help with his pronunciation and butchering of words. This trait shows itself in how he decides to help Chuck in part one to escape and avoid going to jail because they're friends. In part two, we see Becky and Bob get caught disobeying and questioning a sandwich-themed law, and the butcher, or sheriff butcher, takes them to City Hall for King Chuck to decide what their punishment should be. This thoughtful trait has been twisted into being completely loyal only to King Chuck, likely because of the change in motive. It seems like he has access to all the riches he wants, and it would make sense to put everything into making sure that the person who's granting that stays in charge. It would also make sense that he would be inclined to serve someone who doesn't push him to better his vocabulary like Word Girl did. Word Girl's influence on the butcher created nice moments where he would learn new words and feel genuine joy noticing his improvements. Like in the Miss Power episode, where he briefly brags about Word Girl having taught him a word that she's now using with Miss Power. Because being triumphant actually means winning! What? No it doesn't! Oh yeah it does! Word Girl taught me that just last week! Seeing how the absence of her influence having a negative effect on the butcher, whether he knows it or not, subconsciously lets the viewers understand that all that hard work and sacrifices that Word Girl makes are appreciated and overall add quality of life to the very villain she fights against. The relationship between Word Girl and the butcher is one of my favorite in the show because out of everyone, he receives the most benefit from being around her, even if it's a battle in the middle of a fair city national bank, from learning about being well spoken, which she has shown to value a lot. Without Word Girl, he loses is that part of himself and only Becky would know if she decided to let things be as they were in Chucktopia. Dr. Two Brains is a very interesting character because his traits are very contradictory. He has the unique premise that every decision he makes is either made by a highly intelligent man or a malicious mouse, so his decisions are on a wide scale that with little thought makes him seem very unstable. But when examined closely, like I did in a previous video for Steven, it's possible to see which are stable traits and which are situational. In part one, we see Two Brains come to Chuck's and the Butcher's rescue because of his loyalty to food-related villains, and his mannerisms are consistent with what we've seen throughout the show. Show. He's bluntly observational and runs into the same figure of speech misunderstanding as the previous two villains, which only fuels Word Girl's rage at them. In part two, while Becky hides from King Chuck's personal army, she finds shelter in a random sandwich shop. This happens to be the same shop that both her dad, Tim Botsford, and her arch nemesis, Dr. Two Brains, are in. Tim was waiting on a sandwich and Two Brains is preparing it. What's interesting about this pair both being there is that at one point, Two Brains was a well-respected, trusted mentor to Word Girl, on a similar level to how she respects and trusts her parents, both being silly yet good-hearted and responsible adults in her life. Of course, they're not the same, but it's really the traits we're looking at. When Becky sees Two Brains, she exclaims, Dr. Two Brains, and is met with confusion from him as no one calls him doctor anymore, suggesting King Chuck even has the authority to revoke education statuses if one falls out of line. Just like the Butcher and a few other characters, his physical appearance has changed a little. Instead of a wild chaos of hair and his usual lab coat and office attire, his hair has been tamed into a ponytail and is now dressed in a King Chuck sandwich shop branded apron. We're immediately hit with the realization that if there was no word girl, Two Brains would still accidentally fuse his brain with squeakies, but instead of rampaging through the city with his henchmen and a hunger of a thousand mice, he'd be working a minimum wage job at the equivalent of a subway with the existential boredom of an unhappy bartender. From the traits mentioned earlier, he's still very much hungry for cheese and companionship, but the lack of mental stimulation keeps him from being truly satisfied with his circumstances. What I think happened is that King Chuck originally 
originally thought about making him part of his team, but realized his disregard for orders and chaotic personality would make him very hard to control. So he was booted to work as a sub junior assistant manager at the sandwich shop. If Word Girl never existed, he loses his community of fellow villains, his henchmen, and the freedom to tinker whenever he wants. It's also interesting that they mention his very silly assistant title because there are several Two Brain centric episodes of him struggling when in secondary positions, like in Dr. Two Brain's Mr. Cheese and the fill in. Even sadder but funnier to me is that Glenn is his boss and is taking the role very seriously, as he usually does. Also, it just means assistant, assistant, assistant manager. It's like King Chuck made that sandwich shop the equivalent of a get along shirt. What makes me laugh is that even after being given a boring task, he says, Sigh, if only I had a piece of enchanted birthday cake, then I'd wish for things to be different. Because as someone who's worked in retail, especially during, you know, I would say stuff like this all the time, like, Sigh, if only I had a billion dollars, I'd buy this whole place and make them install very nice chairs for us. Becky immediately picks up on what he's talking about and explains that because of her wish, that's why things are the way they are. While she's saying this, we can see Tim miserably eating a grilled cheese in the background, which is so so sad because he's the family chef and if he's miserable with this food, then probably everyone is. After she explains the events of the last two episodes, Two Brain suggests making another wish on a leftover slice of birthday cake. I love how he has this knowledge of enchanted birthday cakes as a scientist, suggesting that he has at least a little knowledge of magic in this universe. Shout out to Two Brains for knowing about magic and never ever acting on it. It's also interesting that this magic comes from Maria, the energy monster, whom he has experimented on, like in the episode Dinner or Consequences. In a show like this, these traits of the universe aren't meant to be taken seriously, but I think it's fun to point out because it's surprisingly consistent. The party, minus Two Brains who got stuck at work, leaves and Two Brains rejoins them on their mission by helping them evade King Chuck's army so Becky can make her wish. He arrives on the scene in his iconic mouse blimp armed with a giant cheese spray when Becky asks where he got the blimp since in this universe he was just a sandwich shop employee. He replies, this? Oh, I build this stuff in my spare time. I hope someday it would come in handy. Two Brains literally went home, changed and brought his giant mouse blimp with him to save her after his shift was over. I think this speaks a lot to his never-ending desire to create things he finds cool or useful. Even in the face of being forced to do something he hates with his entire being, he still finds a way to be himself and this is something that Word Girl can always rely on. I also like this trait personally because we live in a world where many of us are forced to work jobs we find exhausting and unfulfilling, but we still try and find ways to do things that matter to us. There are two things I love about Becky's character. It's her drive to be the best version of herself and her never ending desire to play with anything pretty princess related as someone who was also obsessed with a magic pony show at her age. Unfortunately, this is a narrative and there will be conflict. Becky has shown to be a very responsible and trustworthy superhero to the city, minus a few instances where an understandable lack of self-control got the best of her. Although she seems to have the willpower to be exactly what the city needs at all hours of the day, I'm sure the thought of hanging up her cape for good crosses her mind once in a while on a bad day. What would happen if she decided to stop being word girl? Vocabulary would be largely misused, her dad and countless others would be miserable eating nothing but sandwiches, and everyone would have to follow the types of laws that a five-year-old makes up on the playground to make their classmates laugh. This special is very interesting for Becky's character because she has to save the day as herself without powers. Her wish that she weren't word girl anymore humanizes her a lot. To us, she does have superpowers and an incredible vocabulary, but she's also someone very entertaining to watch and relate to, which is the most important part of her character. In this two-part episode, Becky undergoes a journey to understand the importance of word girl in her city. She learns that while she often has to make sacrifices to keep the city safe, it's for a good reason. What good is spending time with her family if everything about them has changed? TJ no longer believes in the power of justice and having a strong vocabulary. Tim no longer finds joy in the one craft he has shown to dedicate a lot of time and effort into, and Sally no longer fights for what's right as the district attorney, assuming since the villains have completely taken over. All of these things keep Becky grounded and motivated to being the best version of herself too. With understanding this journey she takes, I would also like to take it a level deeper. With a show like this, Becky is meant to be relatable in the choices she makes and the lessons she learns, not always in a literal one-to-one -one way. I think this episode might also be trying to convey that if you have the ability to do good, it's worth it. Whether this be picking up trash in your community, 
community, helping a friend with their homework, or even standing up for something you know is right, it's worth it, but it won't always be easy. Word Girl represents the idea that anyone can be a hero in their own way, even without powers like shown in this episode. All she needed was a good cause and people to help her, and she was able to undo her mistake. I don't think it's really ever the show's intention to convey that Word Girl needs to do everything herself, though. This was always a point of conflict for Word Girl in almost every episode, and I eventually want to make a video on how I think Word Girl should have ended, and it solves this ongoing problem. Some of you may know where I'm headed with this, but I'll stop here. Shout out bonus round. Shout out to this giant bee and its little sandwich. Shout out to Bob's baby chair. Shout out to these roads that will most definitely cause fatal head-on collisions. And shout out to these sody pops with King Chuck's face on them. This episode is my favorite because of the complete change of pace and how everything is turned on its head in such a refreshing and silly way that it's obvious the crew had a really fun time with this two-part special. It feels like a treat from the Word Girl team where they got to give us the most bonkers what if episode they could realistically make. It's also my favorite because it gave the fandom so many funny visuals like all new costumes, the setting changed, little details like the giant bee with his little sandwich that makes me laugh. I live for a good alternate reality twist on a story. Watching the special for the first time, I couldn't tell you where it was going and it was such a wild ride and I still love watching it. There's something so special about a Coraline type of story where the main character ends up in a warped version of their home and tries to make it back before it's too late. This is the type of adventure that you can't really experience yourself and seeing it on a screen fully animated and acted in is the perfect medium to showcase this uneasy feeling of being lost in a twisted wonderland of nightmares. Thank you for watching and thank you to this lovely supporter over on Kofi. If you'd like to be credited in future videos, consider becoming a supporter for only a dollar each month. Also with this video, I wanted to add something special that I'm considering doing for all fandom videos in the future. As of the day that this goes up, there are stickers inspired by this episode up on my Kofi as well. I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you again so much for watching.